We are starting with uh, Daniel Chatnov, who is um, director of scholarly technology at um, George Washington University Libraries. Um, and he's going to talk in about an application uh, that helps researchers um, to collect um, social media data for their research. It's really great to be here at ELAG. It's my first time. I've got the blue dot to prove it. I will apologize in advance for two things. One is I tend to speak really quickly, and I'm trying to fight that. Um, slow me down, make some hand signals if I go too fast. And secondarily, I was I was sick a few I was sick a few weeks ago. Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> and uh, I have this terrible cough uh, that I'm going to try to direct away from the mic. Um, apologies in advance. Uh, I would like to tell you about this application we've written called Social Feed Manager, and because I know some of you are in impatient, geeky types who'd rather just jump to the software, I'll tell you straight away that it's a Python application that uses the Django web framework. It does things like collect user timelines, uh, does filtering samples and searching, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, it will display export user timelines. It's free software available on GitHub. It looks like, uh, sorry, that's the URL for it. If you want to go download it, I assure you it's easy enough that you could theoretically install it and have it working by the end of my talk, um, for which I should set up a timer. And uh, if not, I'd certainly be happy to help anyone get it running uh, through the rest of the week. Uh, and if you want to know what it looks like when it's running correctly, it looks roughly like that. Uh, the URL, again, for the GitHub repo is at the bottom. So I'll just pause and, and uh, leave that there in case anybody wants to clone it, please do. Um, the main thing to say about this project is it's actually, something left happen. it's actually quite a traditional project uh, in that, uh, I, don't, I don't know how inside out it is, uh, it's really uh, traditional in the sense that we're doing a few basic things that look like things we've done in libraries for a very long time. Uh, like expanding the scope of collection development. We're collecting a new kind of thing. We've done that a lot of times over the years. Additionally, it's uh, a story about collecting or licensing resources that are at risk. In this case, it's e-resources of, of a sort, but they are nonetheless at risk and available through licenses, uh, but that's the kind of thing that concerns us because we know we need to collect things that disappear. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is save the time of our researchers. And because uh, we heard such an eloquent statement of that goal of supporting uh, uh, open knowledge creation uh, from our hosts the other day, I I'm gonna lead with that. I'd like to tell you the story about why we even wrote this application. Uh, we, um, I have been working at George Washington University for about two and a, uh, one and a half years. And the year and a half before that, I had been working at the Library of Congress on their Twitter archive project. I was the project manager. So I was pretty familiar with Twitter and the data and how it works and how to work with the data in an efficient manner. Uh, so it was, to my surprise, I read about this story of some research that was published right after I arrived uh, at George Washington University. A faculty member from the School of Media and Public Affairs named Kimberly Gross working with uh, researchers and students around here and the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism had just done a substantial uh, bit of research on the use of Twitter uh, by major media organizations. And uh, while you might find that their primary results, uh, essentially that uh, news agencies basically send their primary news stories to Twitter and not much else. Uh, there's a lot more nuance in this study and I'd encourage you to Google it or use the URL at the bottom. Um, uh, it was important to get this work done. You need to have a baseline to do other comparisons with. And so I immediately contacted her to congratulate her on the work. Uh, it had good press and it was uh, really well put together. Uh, and my question to her was, how are you doing this work? How are you studying this data? And the question was, the, the response she gave me was very clear. They do this by hand. And by hand, what I mean is quite literally, uh, she had subscribed to several dozen media outlets 
uh, using Twitter's former uh, feature of having feeds, uh, Atom feeds or RSS feeds. I can't remember which one it was, but in any case, she'd subscribe to them using Google Reader, which we know will only be around for just a few more days. And she was assigning the students in her class to copy and paste tweet by tweet out of Google Reader, fold spindle, mutilate the data to get it into Excel, and they could use Excel then to load the data or add some coding columns and export that again into something like SPSS or Stata or whatever tool they were familiar with. And um, student labor, whatever help they can get, was going to get them get them forward. And she was able to get this work done, but it's not a lot of work. Uh, sorry, it's not a lot of data for the amount of work you have to put into it. We're talking about thousands of tweets. Uh, and I assure you, that's not very much. Uh, so it's kind of clear that copy, to, copy and pasting to Excel doesn't work. And if you want to know some hard numbers on that, all you have to, need, all you have to do is look at the evaluations uh, of the students who took that course. She was graded down very low. And she doesn't ever want to go through that again, nor do her students. So when I contacted her and I talked about what was really behind the records, if you've never seen what a tweet looks like under the hood, this is it. If this is chopped up a little bit to fit into the screen, but this is a JSON representation, which is the native data format of, twi of tweets, of the very first tweet from March 2006 by one of the co-founders. Some of it's covered up, I know, but essentially you can see the text at the very top there. He says he's setting up his Twitter, which only had uh, five letters back then. They, they uh, got some mezzanine funding and were able to purchase a vowel or two. Um, and additionally, you can see at the bottom uh, how many times it's been retweeted. You can see there's a lot more information under the hood that doesn't necessarily show up in that display. And it's certainly in a raw form here that's easily manipulated by a programmer like myself, but not so much by a social science researcher who doesn't have that training. So frankly, it's a d strategic disadvantage if you have to work this way. Our researchers are going to be spending too much time folding, spindling, and mutilating data before they can get to the hard work of coding the data and achieving some sort of meaningful publishable result. And if you have a basic question in the back of your mind or maybe even the front of your mind, why does Twitter matter? I, I can't maybe convince you, but I can cite for you that in the last two and a half to three years, there have been over 5,000 theses and dissertations published using Twitter as a source of data, according to our searches. Uh, in uh, ProQuest's uh, theses and databases, uh, theses and uh, dissertations uh, collection, just in the last few years. And clearly, just paging through these, you see that it's not just a bunch of CS students, the kind of people who don't necessarily need this help. There are a lot of people in the social sciences doing this work. So uh, if you're looking for a good overview of what that kind of work looks like, I advise you to look at the recently published issue of First Monday. There's a piece by researchers at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign led by Caleb Litoro. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, there's a wonderful piece about the sort of geographical spread and volume of data moving through Twitter. Hopefully it might convince you that there's something meaningful here in the universal uh, availability of this application and the flow of information through it. And in any case, clearly there's something we can do here to help. Uh, so talking to a uh, Professor Gross and some of her colleagues, what we learned is that they're looking for just very specific things. They want to be able to pull up certain users and search by certain keywords, and they want to be able to do it particularly for historic time periods. Like somebody might want to go look at how the word was spread about the Green Revolution in Iran or the Arab Spring or around a traumatic event or a positive event. Um, and they want to get basic values like the text and when it was and certain counts, like whether it was retweeted or not. Uh, and they're dealing with volumes of thousands to tens of thousands, not tens or hundreds of millions. And they ultimately want this data in some sort of delimited format. It's very practical questions. So everything on there is pretty straightforward, as I'll show you in a second, except for historical data. Now, if you want to go back and acquire historical data, it's pretty hard to do it with Twitter's public API, unless, unlike everything else I'll show you in a moment. The options are really threefold. There are three companies you can go to from whom you can license actual data from Twitter. They're called Datasift, GNIP, and Topsy. 
uh, working in an institution that is quite expert at selecting and acquiring e-resources and licensing them. I worked with our e-resources um, content manager, Laura Rubel, uh, to talk to some of these companies. We talked to GNIP and Topsy to see what we could do in terms of getting access to historical data for research purposes. And we found a few basic facts about these companies. One is that they were very friendly and happy to talk to us. Um, unfortunately, though, they're not cheap largely because even though they're willing to lower their margins on selling data to us, knowing that we're researchers, we're not competing with them, they have to pay a certain fee to Twitter that is substantial, and they don't want to lose money supporting our research. And ultimately, they give us more data and more uh, abilities, more capabilities than we really need. In a lot of cases, we just need to sort of slice out some data from a couple years ago with a few keywords pull it down from them and transform it for uh, researchers. <coughs> and they're expensive, if I hadn't mentioned that. And ultimately, we still need to write tools and scripts and things to pull down the data and store it and process it. So if we're going to do, be doing that anyway, the obvious question when you're a software developer who works with other software developers is, can we write software to do some of this ourselves? And the answer is yes. This is what it looks like roughly. It's a home page that shows you a sampling of the data in the system with some sort of daily tweet counts. Uh, we've been running the system for uh, a number of months. The code, again, is here, and I'll have the URL at the bottom. It's available on GitHub. And we can do all but one of those things, essentially. We can't go back and get large slices of data from historic time periods. Um, and we can do all this using the free public API that Twitter provides and is documented quite extensively and works really well. It's quite reliable. We've had very good luck with it. And there are four different ways to get data off the Twitter API that have proven useful to us. The first one is the main one we've been using, and that's going user by user and pulling their recent timelines down. Additionally, you can do a, a filtered stream off the, off the fire hose using uh, keywords and usernames. You can get something called a spritzer feed, and you can do a search. And I've got a few more slides on each of these. Uh, for individual users, like say you wanted to track 20 media organizations, for every one of those individual users, there's an API call to ask for up to 3,200 of their most recent tweets, and they will give that data to you 200 tweets at a time. And if you do this, you have a certain baseline, and you can go back in the future and ask for newer things. The way that works, and this is slightly technical, but any, any programmers among you will be able to work with this kind of model very quickly, you have to remember that Twitter is this constant flow of data, and if you at any point get 200 things in it and you want to go back and get the next 200, you have to remember that that slice of 200 items you got might have moved down because more data has come in in the meantime. So they give you some parameters in the API like since ID and max ID to manage the cursor of data you're pulling down. And once you get your head around that, it's actually quite easy to set up a routine. You can call every few hours and and the first time you call it, it'll get as much data as it can, and the next time you call it, it'll get whatever's new and you store it. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and in the case of one of the major media outlets like Le Monde, uh, as you can see here, maybe you can read it, maybe not, uh, according to the metadata on the account, there have been over 81,000 tweets from Le Monde, and we started this a few months ago, put them in, and since then we've collected almost 12,000 of those tweets. So from a historical time slice perspective, obviously we're missing 70,000. But from the point we started on, we've got it now. If we'd started sooner, we would have had more of it. There's a real opportunity here to grab things while they're available. And uh, just to explain a few more things in this uh, UI, uh, at the left there's a simple view of how many times each tweet has been retweeted, and uh, when it was published, and how many people were following uh, or how many followers they had uh, at the time the tweet came through. That data is a little fuzzy, and I could go into that in more detail, but it's a bit technical. But um, two main things I want you to see are that uh, they will show you their shortened links, and there's a little feature in the application that lets you click on a link and have it fully unwrapped, so you can see what the chain of shortening is and how that all unwraps. And secondarily, um, there's a link at the top left that allows you to click a link and pull down all this data as CSV using a, me a mime type from the server that will pop right into Excel like this. I'm sure you can't read this, 
But this is basically all the values we can pull out of that JSON into a spreadsheet for a researcher to use. And our researchers can essentially go to the site, click that link, and not even interact with us, get the data they need whenever they need it. And this has proven very useful for a handful of people. So far, we've collected about 2 million tweets using this technique for about 1,200 users. Uh, you can group the users into sets and expect export a set all at once and do time slices on the sets or individual users, whatever we need to do. Uh, and what we're collecting is about 40 major media outlets, over 400 US elected officials, about 300 journalists. Uh, those are all for different studies. And for our university archives, we're collecting over 300 Twitter accounts from GW-related groups, including official uh, organizations and student groups. Additionally, you could get what's called a filter stream, where you run a query based on a few uh, keywords or usernames. I'm running out of time, I think, so I'm going to speed up. But essentially, this lets you do things like get millions of tweets coming through as, uh, as they're happening. So uh, if there's a major political event going on, you can fire this off with a few keywords that you see that people are tweeting, and you will get a constant flow live as they're being tweeted uh, of tweets that match those terms. And using this, uh, the, the application will sort of do a rolling file every 15 minutes or whatever interval you set and spread that out into different directories uh, so it doesn't clobber your file system. And uh, in this case, I was running a, a capture of tweets related to the US presidential election day last November. And as you can see, if well, as you perhaps can see if you're sitting up front and have better eyes than me, uh, it was getting about 21 million bytes of compressed data every 15 minutes. If you unpack that, that's a six to eight times ratio, so it's something like 100 and some megabytes of data. And that includes something like 45,000 tweets. And that is something like a maximum of 3,000 tweets per minute that you can get for free. Now, it's complicated what that really means, uh, but using that technique, it's not, it's not necessarily going to get you everything. It's going to get you a sampling. And again, this is a complicated thing I can talk to you about offline if you want to understand it. But I was able to grab millions and millions of these tweets for that 24-hour period. And it proves to be quite useful for that purpose. And just in this example, I had done this during the US presidential debates. And if you are anything of a student or a, a fan of US politics, you might recall that our, our Republican candidate for president said this strange thing during a debate when asked about women taking leading uh, positions, where he said he'd been offered binders full of women to consider. And I, I went through the data I collected and sliced out the hashtag counts per minute using Redis as a back end. And you could actually see the hashtag sort of on this leaderboard move up minute by minute. That's the yellow dots every couple minutes. And you can see like the life cycle of a hashtag and how it appeared. And there were different spellings. And then people coalesced around a particular tag. Now, this is a bit of a frivolous example. But in something like a political situation where the the spread of information is more fluid and there's something more substantial at stake than, oh, you know, the US presidential election. Uh, it can be really valuable to be able to review data this way. Uh, two other ways you can get data are using something called a spritzer feed, which is a small sampling of the entire fire hose of data. It's something like one out of every 200 tweets, give or take. And what you can do with that is capture a completely random sampling of what's being tweeted. And you can get a few million tweets per day. Uh, this can be really useful for someone who wants to retrospectively look at how topics emerged across a lot of people. Now, because it's one out of every 200, if there were only 50 people discussing something, you might miss it all, in which case you'd want one of those other techniques to get it. But like I said, it's another way of providing something just in case. And finally, after an event happens, you can do some retrospective searching of Twitter's API. But it's pretty limited um, in terms of how much data you can get out of it. You might be better off acquiring data. So all this stuff I just described, you can do with no marginal cost. You can use this software or other software that's available to do it. In the hands of one competent programmer, it's not that hard. And it's not really big data we're talking about here. We're talking about gigabytes, not even terabytes. It should fit on one server. Uh, shouldn't be too hard to process. But this much alone meets several of our researchers' needs. And we've received a lot of gratitude. And they've been spreading the word amongst their colleagues and inviting us to uh, 
sort of lunch talks to give an explication of what we're doing, and more people are asking us to help, which is exactly the kind of inroads we've been wanting to make supporting research. But this much alone also shows how at risk this data is. Uh, the, the, the data flowing through social media services like Twitter, not only could a service just fold overnight or be, be bought and uh, the, the API be taken offline, the terms of service choose uh, uh, changed, but you can also see data disappear just from a user. Now as a, uh, as a non-Catholic, I wasn't too sure how the whole Pope resigning thing was supposed to work, but somebody suggested to me that I capture the Pope's tweets. And I don't know if you knew, but when, when uh, the Pope created an account, they actually created uh, eight accounts in eight different languages. And I ran this capture at the very time the Pope was about to leave. And strangely enough, the Pope had tweeted, or the Pope's representatives, had tweeted 37 times in each of these languages. Uh, but when I captured the data, I only got 37 tweets from half of these accounts. Three of them had none, and one of them had 12. It's my theory that somebody was actually going into each account and deleting each tweet one by one, so that 1101, when the Pope had left, or whatever time it was, none of these accounts had any tweets left. So I was able to capture half of that. Now, it's not that many tweets, and maybe this is, again, a frivolous example, but something somewhat more substantial, substantial is in the case of elected officials. Like I said, we're tracking roughly 400 elected officials using Twitter to communicate with their constituents. And we have people who study communication patterns and how uh, bills get uh, sort of brought up from the grassroots and that sort of thing. And correspondence with constituencies is very important. And the moment and the day that the the, the congressional uh, period ended at the start of the year, every two years our uh, lower house of government uh, officials all start a new term or are ele re-elected or, or elected out of office and one third of the upper house uh, begins new terms as well. So there are literally dozens of people coming and going from Congress and people getting sworn in and people leaving. As I was tracking that I could see at least 16 accounts were completely deleted and of these 16 accounts, they had a combined 100,000 plus followers and almost uh, 14,500 tweets from these accounts were deleted and are no longer available, but I captured them. So if somebody wants to study how these accounts were used to communicate with constituencies, there's no other way to get them unless you've done this. So it truly is an at-risk form of collection. So if a researcher needs more support than what this can do, uh, we can certainly work with them, if they want, to connect with one of these third-party providers and support their selection, acquisition, pricing, storing the data, transforming it. But we can also work to collect what's free around it to minimize what they have to buy and how much that's going to cost. Uh, and we can certainly work with them to plan out pricing in a grant application, for example. And in the meantime, we, we're collecting prospectively thinking that some of what we get might be useful and could save somebody a lot of money in the future. So you might ask next, what are we going to do with it? Uh, well, there are a few ideas we have in mind. Uh, number one is we need to certainly just make it a more robust application. Uh, if you want to do a filter stream or sample the spritzer feed, you can only use one account on the streaming APIs at once. So if you want to simultaneously track three or eight or 46 different topics, uh, you have to use multiple user accounts to authenticate, and you have to manage multiple processes. The programmers in the room will know that that means some sort of process manager, some way to fire things up automatically if something gets rebooted, or to restart a process that's become a zombie, so on. So there's some work to do on that front. <coughs> Additionally, uh, some of the other researchers we've started to connect with are studying Sina Weibo, which is essentially Chinese Twitter with a little bit of Facebook mixed in. So we're helping them collect data, and I think we'll just roll the code that supports that into here as well. Other people are looking at the metadata of views and comments and things on YouTube. So we'll probably start, I mean, it's not called Twitter feed manager, it's called social feed manager. We will probably start this summer adding more services to what you can collect here. 
Also, as a librarian who's interested in things like archiving the web, uh, I think there's an opportunity to use this tool to selectively drive archiving of the web. Now, some members of the International Internet Preservation uh, Consortium have started experimenting with this. I think there's more we can do than, I think their experiment was a great first step, and I think there's more to do. Um, particularly around, at least inward facing, uh, the area, the collection of um, university archives. Uh, like student groups, for example, don't necessarily use university resources to publish things anymore. Is that 10 or five? Two, okay. So I'm almost done, good. And finally, I wanna make sure you can, you can use SFM. It's already free, but I want it to be easy for you, to, for you or one of your colleagues to take it and run with it. And there's one last question you might be asking. How do we let people know that this is available? How do people who don't know and haven't connected with us find out that we have this data? Well, I puzzled over this for a long time, but came up with a really obvious solution that you're gonna like. The MARC format is a wonderful way to represent metadata. As you can see in this example of this tweet, 653 subject added entries is great for uncontrolled hashtags. The 700 element lets you have name added entries for user account mentions, 856.42 indicators let you show mentioned links, and the 500 lets you note things like retweet count. Uh, it's also RDA ready, right? Becky, are you out there? Okay. Um, so fortunately, we've been learning about this great tool called Katmandu. It's great for slinging this data around. We've already, I've already been able to index a ton of this stuff in Elasticsearch. We think we're gonna be adding a couple million catalog records a month. We know that WorldCat can handle this because it's web scale. And uh, Tom told me yesterday that they've refactored OCLC identities processing, uh, so it's not gonna be a problem. I've already cleared with the PCC NACO representative, my wife who helped me map the records, to, uh, how to augment authority records, and we know that Summon folks and Andrew and his team are really good at growing consortial catalogs. That's, that's a joke. It's, um, I'm not really gonna do that. Thank you, if you wanna know more, find me here. Well, thank you, Daniel. Finally, Mark records on screen at ELAC. I think we didn't have, I think we didn't have any so far this uh, year. Okay, any